AI Mentors is brought to you by Aulis International, covering your business's staffing, consulting and networking needs. Our podcast, AI Mentors, hosted by Mark Kelly, brings you the leading minds in AI, sharing their story, their success and their advice. Focusing on fast tracking you to the top, AI Mentors cuts through the hype to help you kickstart your data science career. Welcome to the AI Mentors podcast. I'm your host, Mark Kelly. Our guest today is Marco Morales. Marco is a senior director of data science at NBC Universal. He's also a lecturer at Columbia University where he teaches data science to social scientists. But data science isn't his second career. For many years, he served as a senior government official in a path that ended up with stints as a diplomat at the United Nations and the Office of the Mexican Presidency. Perhaps not too surprising when you realize he holds a PhD in political science. Marco, very welcome to the show today. Mark, thanks for the invitation, and I'm really happy to be here uh, talking to you. Tell us a little bit about your journey to building a career working in data science, and how did you make the move into this area? For many years have been, as you mentioned, I have a PhD in political science. My initial biggest passion was uh, political science, polit- politics, uh, and in particular, doing a lot of work with understanding political behavior. Uh, so, you know, I had a, a, a long career uh, doing congressional strategy, doing political communications, crisis communications, diplomacy, and a number of things, and, and, but always with a side interest in, in understanding a lot of why people do the things they do in the political space. Uh, at some point, it, it just became very clear to me that uh, at the level at which I was doing things, it, I had to make a choice between actually having a life uh, and doing something that I really loved. And that's when I decided that I was probably going to step away from government and look around to, to my next career and find my second biggest passion. And, and obviously, uh, once you heard that uh, you've done a PhD and you work a lot in political behavior, you know, I, I, I very quickly realized that my passion was uh, a lot having to do with data and having to understand uh, why people do specific things. Uh, so, you know, at some point it became just very clear that, that my next path had to do with, uh, with data. Uh, data science was at the time just a, a nascent thing, I guess. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be one of the first social scientists that inside data science uh, was uh, allowed as, as, a, as part of their cohorts. So I was a fellow there. I know that, that you have had uh, a couple of people that, that I know from, from inside, Thomas, uh, a few weeks back, Divna, uh, also a couple of weeks back. Uh, so we share that, that particular path. And it was just, uh, I guess, uh, very good luck for me that uh, NBC Universal at the time was looking for a data scientist that had uh, a behavioral uh, expertise. Uh, but also that, that, that it was media. And just a, a side note there is that my family uh, back in Mexico uh, has always been involved in, in media, uh, you know, be it radio primarily, but also television, but also print media, but also uh, other types of alternative uh, media. So I was the little kid that always grew up in studio. So, you know, when NBCU reached out and said, hey, you know, I, we're interested in having conversations with you. It was just, you know, the perfect mish of uh, things that I knew from my childhood, uh, my experience working with data and behavioral aspects, and, and, and that's how it all launched. And what skills do you believe that you took over to your next role that you learned while you're at the UN? Well, I mean, I, th- I think uh, there's a lot of really interesting things going on uh, from, from that life that, that became or, or have been very, very relevant, in, especially in, in my later roles here. Um, I guess very quickly uh, in, in my data science career at NBC Universal, I started undertaking projects and having uh, more uh, leading roles. Uh, so I think uh, the combination of a social science background, uh, some of the, the training that I had, you know, I, I was particularly lucky uh, while doing my PhD to be one of the, the cohorts that was having a very heavy training in statistics, machine learning, uh, econometrics. Uh, you know, we, we were going uh, and trying to figure out how to use uh, text uh, in order to be able to, to infer behavior, things like that. 
um, were, were very helpful, but in conjunction with other, other skills uh, have, have, have been particularly useful for me to define the path ahead in terms of the project that we should undertake to negotiate with people. Uh, so, you know, one of the, the biggest and brightest things about the UN is that every country sends their, their best and brightest negotiators. I, I was uh, incredibly lucky to be mentored by, by uh, our own uh, ambassadors and, and, and diplomats that are incredibly skilled, but also to be uh, at the table negotiating resolutions, negotiating uh, other aspects of, of, uh, of deals that, that, that we were uh, getting together at the UN. Um, and and it, it was an incredible path there. Uh, other skills like uh, you have an, a number of countries where uh, each, each country has a different interest. So you have competing interests. You need to be able to speak to each one of these countries uh, in their own, not only in their own language, but in, the, in their own terms, in the terms of their interests. So, you know, translating across audiences was always a big thing. Uh, thinking strategically about what are the opportunities that lie ahead, being able to adapt really quickly uh, to situations in order to get your goal done, uh, in order to understand what are the limitations of what can be done and not be too stubborn and moving ahead. Uh, but I think above all, uh, people management, uh, you know, motivating your team, getting uh, getting them to understand what the bigger picture is, uh, empower them, um, and, and, and also creating a sense of collective uh, objectives where, you know, even people at your same level, not only people that you're managing, but people at your same level are actually able to move together towards a, uh, a common objective. And, and all of that has been incredibly helpful uh, as a data scientist when, you know, sometimes people come to you with problems uh, and they think they want to solve, you know, one particular problem, and it ends up being the case that really what they're what they should be looking at, or what the what would really add value, uh, is a different type of problem. Just to give the, the you know the, the the analogy of like sometimes people come to you thinking that they just want a faster horse, uh, and you have to convince them that in reality they don't really need a faster horse. They they probably need you know a really good Ferrari that performs really well in the high uh, uh, speed uh, roads that, that lie ahead for you. And that would be a, a much better uh, thing to do. And that obviously implies that, you know, there's a lot of uh, groups that, that, that you're partnering with. A lot of them, you know, finance is trying to drive uh, probably uh, something related to profits. Ad sales is probably trying to boost the, the, the edge, the comparative edge when they go out and sell. Uh, research is trying to do a better understanding of uh, their their audiences, the consumer journey, and other things. So, how do you bring all these people together, and how do you integrate your team into working with them? Uh, uh, are, are, are very, very, very uh, calibrated tasks that you need to do, and I, I'm not sure that that it would have been uh, such a enjoyable journey up to this point had I not had all of these skills from from a previous uh, from my previous career. Because for a lot of people, um, they lack confidence. And for yourself, you didn't necessarily have kind of an astrophysics or kind of physics background or kind of quote unquote standard uh, back from uh, moving into data science. And the imposter syndrome for a lot of people can be a little bit challenging to overcome. How did you find uh, dealing with that? I mean, I think it was a, a, a very peculiar moment for data science and social science when I, when I moved into the field. Uh, as you said, you know, most people at the time had backgrounds in, you know, astrophysics or, uh, you know, just regular physics or computer science or neuroscience, you know, were, were just like the, the standard things that people thought about when they thought about uh, data scientists. Uh, and obviously at the time, you know, when you came to the, to the job market and people would be like, wait, but you're a social scientist. You really don't know what you're talking about. You really don't understand all of these things. And at the beginning, I was a, a little bit, you know, convinced that, yeah, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe, you know, all the, the training that I have is really not applicable to, to data science. Uh, but it was just through my network and through my cohort that, that very quickly I just realized that, uh, you know, things are called by different names, like, you know, regularized regression uh, in some settings, you know, we used to just call it regression with, with, with uh, constraints. 
constraint regression and, and it was just the applications were the same, the math is the same, the mechanics were the same, and then I just realized that a lot of the statistics that I knew uh, had just different names in other disciplines, a lot of the econometrics had just different names in, in other disciplines. Uh, and, and at some point, even the mathematics, uh, you know, the, we used to do uh, as social scientists, you're very used to using advanced mathematics just to model behavior and do some optimization um, in models that, that explain certain social phenomena. And, and, you know, people in other disciplines do very similar uh, equations of uh, systems of equations that they resolve, that they optimize on. So it was, uh, it was a very interesting journey. And at some point, I, I just simply realized, like, I'm, I'm as prepared as anybody else in this field. Uh, but also I have, uh, as a social scientist, and we social scientists have uh, a few additional advantages, a few additional skills, you know, including the behavioral aspect of things that 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 some other data scientists uh, don't have. So I think a, a lot of, the, uh, in my case, a lot of it was about uh, understanding this overlap of skills just with different names across disciplines, but also about finding the right industry where my whole package would be most helpful. And 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 I've been very lucky to to be in media where all of this is highly applicable, highly relevant. So you can kind of see the benefits that a person can bring from a social scientist background. Can you see more social scientists going into this area or do we need more, si more social scientists coming into data science? I mean, I, I'm, I'm perfectly convinced at this point that, that data science does really need a lot of social scientists. And, and you're, you're beginning to see a lot, of, a lot of us moving into data science. Uh, but the, 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 probably the, the bigger question here is why do you say that, that, uh, that social scientists are needed in data science? And I would say that in addition to, to having a, a very similar skill set to everybody else, I think there's a few additional things that social scientists bring to, to the table. And uh, probably... The most important one is um, we deal with very, very messy data. Uh, a lot of uh, disciplines that are typical in, in data science uh, deal with very clean data, very clean experiments. I mean, if you are an astrophysicist uh, and you're working with a radio uh, telescope, uh, your data has very, uh, it, it's very easy to clean. Uh, while as we have, you know, data with people that tend to not respond service to people that uh, tend to, uh, you know, uh, respond with particular biases or, or uh, given the questions that you ask, given the uh, contextual place where you are collecting the data. Uh, so it, it's very, very messy data. So uh, we're, we're used to, to, to doing that, to cleaning it, to thinking about how best to, to make uh, data representative. Uh, we also are, are very uh, keen of working on, on experiments. Uh, there is a very strong discipline uh, within uh, the social scientist that deals with uh, causal inference, uh, the, the hardcore experimentation. And because our data is so messy, uh, there's been a huge advancement in, in how to carry out experiments or how to use uh, other metrics uh, or other tools, statistics, and even machine learning as of recent date uh, to, to get uh, causal inference uh, from, from the data. Uh, but I think also another uh, differentiating factor is that social scientists tend to tend to do tend to have the necessary tools to do two very specific things. On the one hand, you do inference a little bit uh, along the lines of you want to explain why the world is uh, observed in the way that you observe it today. You know why are we observing more people watching uh, you know the Real Housewives of Atlanta relative to uh, you know. Uh, the previous month where, where you wouldn't have expected that to be the case. You're trying to explain why something happened the way it did, but you also are very good at predicting, given the knowledge of what you know of the past, can you use that information uh, to make a, a better informed guess about the future? Uh, and and uh, it, it just becomes a, a, a very relevant uh, toolkit, I would say, for social scientists. So you know, just to sum it up, I mean, part of what, what social scientists do all the time is you're trying to understand human behavior. You're trying to do it using a ton of data and being very smart about it. So you know, it, it, it's just even natural that given that data science deals all the time uh, with one degree or another of human behavior, that you, know, you would want somebody that, that knows how to do this and that has been doing it for a long, long time. So. Um, it, it seems to me that there is a, a, a very 
natural overlap there. And, and you're seeing a lot of this happening in units in, I don't know, Facebook or in Spotify or even in Netflix that are dealing with a lot of social science uh, and, and are leveraging a lot of our knowledge. Uh, and there's a lot of teams that, that are just specifically looking for, for social scientists for, for this skill. So I think a little bit of the imposter syndrome might be a little bit alleviated for, for social scientists if, when they hear this. Yeah, definitely. Tell us a little bit about how much time you spend defining the right problem and being careful not falling down the rabbit hole of, uh, wouldn't it be cool? if we went down this track or wouldn't it be cool snare and working to impact to making sure that the problem that you're actually working on does actually make an impact uh, to the organization uh, that you're working in day to day. Sure. Uh, so uh, I think this is probably one of the, the, the biggest and most challenging, but also most rewarding aspects of, of, uh, of data science. And of course, you know, the, the, what you describe is just, one of the quintessential leadership problems that, that you can have. So let me tell you a little bit about how I'm, I'm tackling a lot of this. Um, I think uh, what, what, you, what you have to start off is with understanding uh, very clearly where is your business, your company heading in terms of uh, the objectives, the long-term objectives, are they trying to transform themselves? And if they are, like a lot of media is right now, you know, you're, you're running a little bit uh, behind the curve in, in, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, consumption app habits of, you know, Gen Z, Gen Y, uh, what are these people doing? How are they changing their patterns, their behaviors? And how is the company thinking that uh, they're going to try to move uh, and, and, and try to match those patterns uh, more cleanly? So uh, if, if you don't understand this path, I mean, it's very, very difficult for you to, to add value. Uh, but and I would say that probably uh, just having this understanding and, and, and understanding where you can add value is probably one of the most uh, uh, important contributions that you can make as a data science uh, leader. I guess the second thing is, is uh, you also need to be very careful of, of not just you know, trying to, to be uh, embedded in a lot of hubris. And I'm a data scientist and therefore I know better than anybody else. Uh, you really don't. Uh, I think part of the bigger picture that you need to, to understand is that you are a partner with everybody else in, in the business. So, you know, be it the C-suite, be it executives, be it other teams, uh, you're, you're in, in most cases, you are their partner. So if you're not in constant communication with them to understand what exactly are their needs, what are, exactly are their constraints, um, how do these change over time, what are the expectations as to where they need to also move, uh, and what is it that it's truly valuable to them, uh, then it will be very, very difficult for you to, to, to add value. Um, but also uh, to, to your last point, which I think is, is, is probably one of the most relevant for people moving into data scientists, it's, it's really very common that you find that, you know, let's, let's face it, we're geeks, right? So uh, you find the coolest new algorithm and you want to test it and you want to try it out. And, you know, people will just come to you and say, hey, you know, uh, I want to try this. I want to do this or I want to uh, run this massive experiment and do these really great things. Uh, and, and as a data science leader, you also need to understand a little bit of uh, when you should let them lose in, in, in just carrying out really great ideas, but also when you do need to, you know, narrow down and explain the scope of what you're trying to do and, and maybe uh, helping them go down the path that will be the most efficient path, even if not the coolest path for this particular project. So it's, it's, it's a, a very delicate balance, you know, because you want your team to, to remain engaged, to be current, to, uh, you know, learn a lot by doing, but you also need to be very, very effective. So I think part of that is, is just um, having a very close uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, very deep relationship with, with your team so that you can uh, explain to them uh, when is the time to just, you know, go out and do the cool thing? Uh, and when is the time to, to just, you know, do what is actually necessary? It's a, yeah. But I would say it's a great challenge. 
Yeah, it's a really is big challenge because you're you're trying to manage for return on investment. You need you need to be able to show the wider business the impact it's having, but you also don't want to clip the wings too much because you want to have that research where people are trying different things, learning new things, and seeing you know let's see if we can challenge the status quo as well. Talking about your background in media, your family ties, and all the different uh, learns you've had along the way, how do you see AI improving the customer journey? that we all will probably be involved in in some way? I mean, I would say that, that uh, the, the, the impact of AI in media, even though it has been a bit of a, a, a latecomer, I think is, is just gaining enormous amount of traction. Uh, so for instance, you, 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 I mean, th there's a lot of areas of application probably. And we were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier. So, um, you know, you can, you can think of the applications of AI for media in, in simpler things like, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to work on dynamic pricing, whether you are, um, you know, selling tickets to movies or selling tickets to parks or selling tickets to attractions or selling tickets to, uh, I don't know, to the theater. Um, you want to use a lot of information to, to provide a lot more uh, I guess a closer price for what people are willing to pay, but also uh, to to create a better experience for them. You know, can you can you can you predict what other things in addition to just a you know a movie ticket might they be willing to go for? Are they you know also interested in other accompanying services that you have? So you know, one big area to do that. Uh, other areas uh, probably that you have seen a lot of right recently. Uh, computer vision is becoming and, and has been I would say for for a few years now uh, a, a huge thing just because you have so many hours of content you have so many hours of um, of video that you need to tag because uh, you know having an army of people might be very uh, applicable but not really very efficient and it will be incredibly costly so why not use AI to start tagging content is this a commercial is this uh, you know, the, the uh, I don't know, the monologue from Jimmy Fallon, is this just a segment where the artist is singing? Who is this artist that is there? Uh, can we leverage a lot of that information in order to get uh, a better uh, model that would help us predict what pieces of content might be better uh, suited or the order of content or, you know, should should uh, where should you locate each piece of content so that we maximize the, the viewership that we have, you know, does that even matter when you are relating that to what's going on in other networks and, you know, can we actually use some predictive models to, you know, given that we are, we will be seeing certain types of content in other networks is that, you know, cannibalizing and this is uh, a little bit bigger than just uh, your basic analytics, you know, in, in the consumer space, this is a lot more of applied neural nets or applied uh, uh, models that 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 just end up using the whole range of information that exists in the data, even if we can't understand it as as humans. So the applications, I think, are 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 unlimited, and and they should, and and probably they do uh, take us to the next level of uh, how consumers can can have a much better experience and probably uh, there might be a lot of opportunities uh, in, in, in the new uh, services that, that will be launched in media. You know, we have an NBCU, we have Peacock, uh, HBO is launching also a, another new service, Disney Plus has just launched it. And the bigger thing right now is, uh, you know, do you really, everybody's using recommender systems, right? So uh, you as a user come into the service and, and you get something that is suggested to you. And probably uh, a lot of what we need to think about and be very smart about is, you know, do we really want the best um, uh, algorithm that optimizes the experience in terms of, if I've already watched The Real Housewives of New Jersey, do I really want to watch all the Real Housewives that exist out there? It is possible. Or do I really want this recommender system to help me uh, discover other things that I would normally not go to, but I might find myself uh, closer to. So in other words, uh, what we're trying to do or what we should be trying to do uh, is, is probably not just finding the best algorithm at, at minimizing uh, distance between two pieces of content, but you know, we might want to determine something that is still close to what you like, but 
uh, is also relevant to open up different spaces. And you know, developing that algorithm is, is an incredibly interesting challenge that, that media is beginning to, to undertake. But it has taken some time for us to think critically about uh, how to get there. I think we are uh, thinking a lot more critically about the consumer experience, the consumer journey. Uh, but again, it's a marriage of AI and people that are very good at thinking critically and, and, and understanding how people engage with the products that you have in media. So a lot of uh, good opportunity, a lot of, uh, a lot of new things that will be coming out that people should be uh, looking out for. Marco, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, you've been listening to the AI Mentors podcast. Our guest has been Marco Morales, Senior Director of Data Science at NBC Universal. Thank you for your time today, Marco. Thank you, Mark, and thanks for the invitation, and stay safe. Get the Aldous Advantage. Become a member of the Aldous community and enjoy some of the following. AI meetups. Once a month, our community gathers to listen to some of the leading experts in the world of data science and AI. Our speakers come from all over the world, including Dublin, Boston, and Frankfurt. We also have our AI mentors. Our experts will provide mentoring to the Aldous members. And don't forget our AI in Action podcast. Each week, we have guests from all over the world talking us through their education, career, and more. Become an Aldous member and get the Aldous advantage. For more information and to sign up for our newsletter, log on to www.aldous.com. That's www.aldous.com. Aldous International, empowering through AI.